Hello everyone, and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I'm Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I'm delighted to be reading chapter 15 of my grandfather's book, Around the Horn by Frank Downs. Chapter 15 includes Birmingham School of Music, New Street Station, Collapse in Town Hall, Cardiff, National Anthem. One of the most satisfying aspects of returning to Birmingham was joining the staff of the Birmingham School of Music, now Birmingham Conservatoire. The school at that time was facing troubled times both politically and administratively. Dr Christopher Edmonds, its principal, a marvellous man and architect of its post-war reconstruction, invited me to teach Horn there. Though time was limited, owing to a busy CBSO schedule, I found teaching most rewarding. Julius Harrison was now conductor of the School of Music Symphony Orchestra. It was good to renew acquaintance after playing for him in pre-war days. My first successful student, Christopher Jonathan Satterthwaite, was appointed by Raphael Kubelik as second horn at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, at the end of his three-year course at the school. I have written his name in full for two reasons. It was the longest name I have ever met in teaching, and to remind me that he had great difficulty at times writing his full name in block letters each time he was confronted by an application form. He was a splendid student and the story of his successful appointment is a remarkable one. I had sent him to London on this particular day to do two auditions, one in the morning for a position in the National Youth Orchestra and in the afternoon to audition for a vacancy in the Covent Garden Orchestra. The competition for places in the National Youth Orchestra is well known, but nevertheless I thought he would probably stand a fair chance of being accepted. His application for the demanding post of second horn in the Opera House was, on the other hand, a tall order for a young and inexperienced player. The main object of that exercise was to give him experience in auditions. The unexpected happened. He failed his audition in the morning, had lunch, went over to Covent Garden, played to Kubelik and was successful. In later years, he was joined in that orchestra by another ex-student from the Birmingham School of Music, Peter Smith, who went there via the CBSO and BBC Symphony Orchestra. There followed in subsequent years Robert Blackburn, Halle and present Principal Horn of the CBSO, John Tyler, Principal Horn English National Opera, Adrian Norris, BBC Concert Orchestra, and Paul Farr, Halle Orchestra. Blackburn and Tyler hailed from the Coventry area and used to travel in by train for their lessons and I remember there were complaints lodged by passengers that they practised duets in their compartment on the journey. I learned about their exploits quite by accident. Coming home by train from London where I had been playing the previous evening I alighted at New Street Station, and as I walked along the platform carrying my French horn, I was unaware that the guard of the train was a few paces behind. He caught up with me, and looking at my instrument said, Is that a French horn, mate? I nodded. Thought it was, he continued. There are two young buggers who come in from Coventry every Wednesday on this train. They're a bloody nuisance. I'm getting complaints every week from passengers that they practice in the compartment. I shall put them in the guard's van next week, he said as he walked towards the front of the train. As I made my way home amused, I decided that such unbounded enthusiasm should not be a cause for disciplinary action. New Street Station, or rather one of the tunnels which lead into the station, was the scene of an incident a few days later involving the CBSO. We were returning from a Saturday evening concert in Sheffield and it was usual on such journeys to have a reserved coach for the orchestra at the end of the train. Generally we would arrive back in New Street around one in the morning but on this particular occasion we were much later. 
The train arrived in Birmingham, but we were unable to alight. Our coach was still in the tunnel. After much clanging and banging, amplified by the acoustics of the tunnel, we were conscious of being shunted and the lights in our coach went out. There was a distinct feeling of panic as the claustrophobic atmosphere, silence and total darkness encompassed us. We had been shunted into a siding. The wind players, particularly the brass, saved the day. We opened the windows and blew like hell. <laughs> in decibels was tremendous and we must have been heard in the city centre. Help arrived but it was dark and almost daybreak when a tired and understandably angry bunch of musicians reached platform one. No logical reason was ever given for this extraordinary happening. However, subsequent journeys were taken by road. For me, the summer of 1950 proved to be a disastrous one. I had not been feeling well for some days with digestive disorder steadily worsening, but with summer holidays in view, I continued to work. As a result, I was forced to take a holiday in hospital with a burst gastric ulcer and the circumstances in which this occurred in the town hall were traumatic. I was extremely unwell at the afternoon rehearsal for the Thursday evening symphony concert, so much so that George Weldon sent me home at the interval advising rest before the evening concert. There was a little improvement as I made my way back to the town hall at about 7.15 for a 7.30 start. Several colleagues remarked on how pale I looked as I took my instrument from its case. The orchestral bell was ringing at 7.25, summoning us to the platform, and I made my way up a flight of stairs to the rear of the orchestra. And as I reached the entrance, I collapsed. I have only dim recollections of the next hour or so. I had passed out. I came to in the orchestral green room with the manager of the orchestra giving me a small quantity of brandy. Unfortunately, though given with the best of intentions, this was the one thing he should not have done, and I hemorrhaged. I remember being carried on a stretcher through the band room as Cyril Preedy, the soloist in the Brahms B-flat piano concerto, made his way past me to perform. I was conscious of the clanging bell of the ambulance as it tore down New Street en route for the General Hospital. Recovering over the summer months, I was able to begin work again in the early weeks of autumn, shortly before Rudolf Schwarz became the new conductor of the CBSO. We had already played for Rudolf Schwarz several times when he appeared as guest conductor, and on each occasion the orchestra members were very impressed by his innate musicianship. His appointment was seen by the majority of players as a forward-looking one. They were not disappointed. As for myself, I must say that the two years or so with him were exhilarating and full of musical interest, though it is true that it took a little time to adjust to his stick technique after the clear beat of Weldon. It is not very often that the playing of the national anthem causes problems, but I do recall an occasion with Schwarz quite soon after he came to Birmingham. We were in fact playing at the Park Hall in Cardiff, and of course not one national anthem, but two were to be played. The confusion arose in the evening, when it had not been made clear in which order they were to be played. Chaos ensued, as some played the Welsh anthem and others the national anthem. One would have thought there would have been confusion in the large audience too. Not true. The fervour of those Welsh voices won the day, and practically obliterated the orchestral mayhem, with the result that Land of My Fathers was established well before the second phrase. That day was memorable too for the visit of the French rugby team to Cardiff Arms Park. French and Welsh supporters thronged the city, sporting national colours as we arrived by coach at Park Hall, and as we were a little early, four of us went to a cafe opposite for morning coffee. As coincidence would have it, all four were from the Black Country area of the Midlands. Ensconced in the corner of the cafe, we were chatting and occasionally lapsing into Black Country dialect. The manager of the cafe, standing close by, came over to us. Now, what would you like, gentlemen? Four coffees, please, we replied. 
the manager turned to a waiter standing near the counter. Four coffees for the French gentleman, he called out. He obviously knew we were foreign. I have already mentioned that I enjoyed my two years with Rudolf Schwarz, but sadly, towards the end of 1952, I had a recurrence of my previous illness, which subsequently led to an operation. And though I made a complete recovery, medical advice was strongly in favour of a less physically exhausting occupation. It is perhaps not generally recognised how exhausting travelling around the country by coach and train can be, and in the case of musicians there is not only the stress of concert giving, but as in my case, the frequent irregularity of suitable meals. I was extremely fortunate, therefore, when shortly after this medical advice, a vacancy presented itself in 1953 in the BBC Midland Orchestra. I applied for the position in the hope that should I be successful, the quiescent nature of studio life might be the answer to my problem. As ever, I found the audition an ordeal, though the panel of five must have suffered too, listening to nearly 30 applicants over two days. The gods were with me, and within a month or so, I found myself settling down to studio life. The BBC Midland Orchestra in those days was incredibly versatile, operating under two conductors. Gilbert Finter, mainly in the light music field, in which case it was the BBC Midland Light Orchestra, and under Leo Wurmser for serious music as the BBC Midland Orchestra. The first thing that impressed me about that orchestra was the happy atmosphere created by the friendly relationships which existed amongst its players and conductors. There was a spirit about it which was unique, and this ambience prevailed throughout my succeeding years there. Broadcasting within the four walls of a studio was a vastly different experience and one cannot deny that although there was a far larger audience listening than in a concert hall, one missed the rapport with a large audience. This aspect being most noticeable when, as we frequently did, playing to audiences on outside broadcasts. One of the many events I remember from those early weeks was recording the Archer's signature tune, for which we were each paid the princely sum of four guineas. Played twice daily with omnibus editions on Sundays, for well over 20 years, I do not really consider we were overpaid. However, I am glad that musicians these days are more suitably rewarded for repeated signature tunes. Gilbert Finter spent almost all of his post-war career as a BBC staff conductor and was, I always felt, very much underrated. He was an ideal broadcaster, seemingly relaxed and calm under pressure. His vast experience in the medium and excellent musicianship generated confidence to all in the studio. Broadcasting four or five live programmes a week called for a high degree of competence from all concerned. Very few were recorded in those days. I first met him at Uxbridge during the war years. He was a very fine bassoonist and, like many of his colleagues in the RAF Central Band, had joined from one of the famous orchestras in London, Beecham's London Philharmonic. He was a prolific composer and all horn players will know and will have played at one time or another his solo for horn, Hunter's Moon, surely one of the best pieces of descriptive writing in the repertoire for that instrument. Interestingly enough, he wrote that piece in Torquay, Babacum to be exact, during the war years. The title of the piece was apparently inspired not by romantic associations, but from a pub he frequented in Babacum, Hunter's Moon. One is immediately reminded of the parallel, though not musically, with the Delius Walk to the Paradise Garden, which was also the name of a pub. The brass band world has reason to be grateful to Gilbert Vinter for the many splendid pieces he wrote for that medium, as exemplified in the many fine test pieces he wrote for the annual national championships, which were exceptionally challenging in technical demands and original in style. His untimely death after a short illness at the age of 59 was a very sad time for all who had known and worked with him. End of chapter 15 To end this podcast episode, I am going to play 
Movement 3 from Centenary Fire Dances by Andrew Downs. This work was composed for the City of Birmingham for its centenary celebrations in 1989. The reason I have chosen this work is because it was composed to go along with a large fireworks display and all the noise created by the music and the fireworks reminds me of the noise the brass and woodwind of the CBSO had to make in order to get out of the train tunnel. I chose this particular movement because the rhythmic vitality is very similar to the Archer's theme tune that my granddad was playing on for all those years on Radio 4. This is Movement 3, Irish Dance, performed by the Birmingham Conservatoire Symphony Orchestra under Jonathan Del Mar. <laughs> 